Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. And just when I think that I've covered every imaginable topic on this podcast, I came across another inspiring guest with a unique story. And I've got to tell you, that's why I love recording this Daily Tech Podcast. So today's guest is Lawrence Forsley, and he's a senior experimental physicist with NASA, research fellow at the University of Texas, and CTO of the Global Energy Corporation. And during the past 45 years, he's worked with laser fusion, mirror fusion, tokamaks, modeling, and so much more. And he's also the co-author of over 40 scientific papers and book chapters. With his colleagues, he developed the Trackers STEM program for equating university students and faculty with condensed matter nuclear reactions. And in his spare time, he's developed and deployed autonomous seismic sensors around the world and applied space-based differential interferometric synthetic aperture radar to places that are hard to write home from let alone even pronounce. So I invite you all to geek out with me today in a wonderful conversation with Lawrence Forsley. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Larry. Can you just tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? I'm a uh, senior experimental physicist with the NASA Glenn Research Center. Uh, I'm involved with what's called the Advanced Energy Conversion Project. And I'm also a research fellow with the University of Texas uh, nuclear um, Engineering Teaching Laboratory. And there's so many reasons I'm excited to get you on the podcast today because the research that you've been doing is indeed fascinating and it's essentially a form of nuclear reaction that produces little to no radiation. Is that correct? Uh, not exactly. Um, radiation comes in a lot of different forms and, and I come from the, the, the hot fusion community where for the last 45 years we've used high power lasers and huge magnets to uh, initiate these reactions or uh, confined gases at temperatures 10 times hotter than the center of the sun. The problem is that those reactions have two thirds of the energy go off with fast neutrons, which are really not good for anyone. And because they have no charge, they can't be stopped very easily. And when they finally do stop, they tend to knock other atoms around and break your reactor or they make things radioactive. So that's not good. Um, the condensed matter nuclear reactions that we do will produce conventional radiation products like fast neutrons. But paradoxically, it turns out um, we've also observed what we call aneutronic reactions, which does not produce neutrons. And so that's a really good thing. And the output that we get then are alpha particles. Now, alpha particles are radiation, but they're basically helium nuclei stripped of their electrons, and they very quickly find electrons and they turn back into helium. So uh, no harm. So the other way of looking at this is radiation is kind of a two-edged sword. Um, if it's the right kind, it's useful. And if it's the wrong kind, it's bad. It, it's sort of like UV from the sun. A little gives you a tan, a bit more, you get a sunburn, and over time you get cancer. So why is producing little to no radiation so important? Just to get everybody on the, this, the same scene here. Sure. Uh, if you're going to make a consumer product, you don't want dangerous radiation, in particular high energy X-rays, gamma rays, which are even more energetic, or neutrons flying out and injuring someone. Um, it's less of a problem in a big power plant because you can shield it. But in space, which is part of what I'm interested in, space shielding uh, takes up space and adds weight, and they're both at a premium up there. Um, but again, some forms of radiation like fast protons, which are hydrogen nuclei and alpha particles can generate power or can even be used for propulsion. So is this cold fusion or is it related to cold fusion? I think cold fusion is a misstatement of an observation. Um, as one of my colleagues noted, condensed matter nuclear reactions, which is what we're doing, um, are neither cold nor necessarily fusion, but they are nuclear. Uh, even the term the term cold fusion dates back to a, a Scientific American article in the 1980s by Steve Jones at BYU, and he was trying to explain something else, but it got picked up by the press in 89 and off we went. 
Now, although I'm no expert in this field, cold fusion as a concept has been discredited for years, and many people think of it as a myth even. So can you tell me a little bit more about why people came to believe that cold fusion is just not possible? <laughs> so I've heard. <laughs> Yet the U.S. <laughs> Navy and NASA, along with groups from 14 countries around the world, and with my group, we've published 60 peer-reviewed papers on these reactions. Um, it's taken 30 years to understand how this could be possible, but it did have its roots back in the early 1920s. And those observations were themselves withdrawn because of incomplete knowledge. The view being quantum mechanics makes this impossible, therefore it didn't happen, but we missed a few things. Now, I understand that government agencies stopped funding cold fusion research some time ago, but they're, they're now beginning to fund it again. So which agencies are funding your research, and why do you think they're doing that now, do you think? Well, NASA funded us for a number of years, and that's what resulted in these two papers uh, that were just published in the physics journal uh, Physical Review C this past April. Um, those papers, by the way, are kind of middle of the road between the hot fusion community and, um, if you will, low energy nuclear reactions. Um, I wouldn't say that governments in the U.S. Or around the world are leaping into this. They're nibbling at the edges of it. The need is great. The promise is phenomenal. But there's also a lot of pushback because, as you noted, uh, there is a lot of concern that this can't possibly be true. And one of the things that I always try and do on this Daily Tech podcast is to try and demystify a lot of technology and put it in a language that everyone understands. Your research focuses on lattice confinement fusion. So in layman's terms, what does that mean and how does it work? So what you've got is a metal lattice. The papers we published happen to use titanium and one used erbium. We have deuterium in there, which is a heavy isotope of hydrogen instead of one proton, it's a proton plus a neutron, and we can pack those in there with the density that is basically greater than solid matter if you had, had solid um, deuterium. What happens then is they still don't like each other, They're positive charges. So if you can imagine having two magnets with the pluses fitting each other, when you squeeze them together, they move apart. You cut of the inherent electrons from the titanium or erbium atoms present, or in palladium, there is a greater possibility that these two pluses get canceled by the local negative electrons. In fact, the way I look at this is it's sort of like the difference between the hot fusion and the cold fusion, so to speak. Hot fusion is like karate. You have to force the atoms close enough, and the strong nuclear force pulls them together despite those positive charges. Whereas what we're doing in lattice confinement fusion, or the misnamed cold fusion, is more like a kaido. We're using the blending of the electron shielding to hide the nuclei charges from each other and blend them together, and we get fusion out. So what is the outcome of lattice confinement fusion, and what has actually been demonstrated so far? Um, I would argue that lattice confinement fusion goes all the way back to what Pons and Fleischmann initially saw, and what we've been doing both with the U.S. Navy Spay War in years past and with um, uh, NASA over the last several years, um, what we're trying to do is measure the reaction products coming out by stimulating these by various ways, by using um, electrolysis to drive the deuterium into the metal lattice by using um, electron beams as other colleagues in Russia and in India have done, by using a gamma beam, which is again, very, very high energy electrons to set up a cascade of nuclear events and then measure the products that come off. And I appreciate this is a pretty big question, but how soon do you expect that this type of fusion can be refined, commercialized, and scaled? Is there any kind of ballpark time on that you could give? It's only a question of money and time, like most things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I would hope that because of the work that we just published, we have a deeper insight as to how to get gain, which is to scale up the reactions to useful amounts. Um, depending on how we view that, I would think that in the next two to three years, we should be able to move to laboratory 
uh, and what we call benchtop demonstrations, where the key is the amount of energy taken to drive it uh, is less than the amount of energy that you get out. Now, you have the additional problem that if you want to convert that energy into electricity, because of the inefficiencies of converting, say, heat to electricity, you need to get about 10 times more heat out than you had uh, energy coming in to be able to make up for that. So we're, we're years away from that, but that's one way to do it. The second way to do it is because you've got these very fast charged particles, electrons, protons, alphas, that you could conceivably do what's called direct conversion. And as they slow down, use them to drive electrons around through a wire, and now you've got electricity directly. So if there is a way through these nuclear vents to liberate more energy than is actually consumed, what would that mean in terms of generating, I don't know, abundant carbon-free energy? There's, a, there's several different ways this can come out. The, the way that I'm looking at it right now is primarily for um, deep space applications where we need this to be compact, have maybe uh, 10 kilowatts electric coming out and have a lifetime of 10 to 30 years. On the ground, if you can build a device like that that works in space, you could imagine this being used um, basically for individual homes, for small neighborhoods, and if you can make it small enough, uh, laptop computers. The work that we're looking at for using this in CubeSats in space, which are very, very tiny, you know, they weigh a couple kilograms, we don't have much room in there, and if you can power a CubeSat, you can power a laptop and maybe even a cell phone. And just for everyone listening to help them understand what we're talking about here, what are some of the applications for this type of energy? I mean, could it be used in energy plants or to power cars or, or is it, or what else is there out there? I would think that um, it's a question of scaling. Yeah. Uh, as I said, if um, you know we're successful in, in defining this for deep space, as I say, if it's safe enough to launch from Florida, it's safe enough to use in Florida. Uh, as a consequence, you could use it potentially to run cars. Uh, I can imagine using this for running um, electric aircraft, and that has the advantage, especially if you had small drones, they could stay aloft for days, months, weeks, maybe even longer. Um, again, using this, developing this for the very confined spaces we have for spacecraft puts us in a real burden but if we can do that, then it really has a lot of consumer practical applications here on the ground. And of course, when we're talking about anything like this, the two big questions that people will be people listening might ask is how safe would it be and how much waste would it produce? Is there anything around that that you can expand on? Yeah, the um, we've we've looked at the material that is left, and helium is one of the products. Um, it may be that you produce a small amount of short-lived radiation from a neutron capture, proton capture on the uh, metal lattice, but within uh, a relatively short period of time, we're talking about days or less, uh, that reduces down to nothing harmful. And we've actually published papers on this. Um, it is far cleaner than fission, and I would say far cleaner than fusion, because we don't have the uh, large number of neutrons, fast neutrons flying around. And unlike fusion, which has spent you know several billion dollars over the last 30 years, um, it's not been shown to be practical yet, despite the money that's put in and the uh, work that's being done in ITER in France. And for everybody listening, we'll have people listening in 165 countries, but w nobody in space yet. But one day, never say never. But what would this oh, mean? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but what would this mean for general consumers on a day-to-day -day basis? Do you think? Um, I think we would have decentralized power. A lot of the problems that we've seen over the last several years, especially here in the U.S., uh, is our grid is is not hanging together very well, and we're beginning to come to the realization that using green energy, windmills and um, solar, it's very uneven. In fact, we've seen this on Guam where you have huge amounts of wind come through all of a sudden or you have the sun suddenly blocked by clouds. And it's very difficult to take a conventional power plant and keep up with that. So what you want to do is have 
smaller decentralized power plants. And there's nothing, how shall we say, uh, more decentralized than having the power in each of your homes. And at the moment, we're thousands of miles apart and we're both locked down. And of course, there are 24 hour rolling news channels on both sides of the Atlantic, spreading a whole lot of fear at the moment. And I think we're all looking for a little bit of hope. And this seems like something to be very hopeful about. So how would you summarize what this might mean for our future? I think it has the possibility of producing um, a CO2 and methane free energy source that is compact and safe. Um, it has application from relatively small scale, perhaps laptop, maybe even a cell phone, and all the way up to uh, powering homes and cars and possibly electric aircraft. Uh, the emphasis that we have in trying to develop it for space means that whatever we come up with is both safe, secure, and sound. And uh, I think that has a lot of application on the ground. I am conscious we've covered so much ground today and we've covered a lot of topics. For anyone that would like to delve in a little bit deeper, uh, what's the best place to find you online and ask you or your team any questions if, they, uh, if they'd if like to start that conversation? Um, there's a link um, that I think uh, we have uh, to Google Scholar, which has got a number of papers there. Um, we're putting together... Uh, some material right now. One of them is what we call the Tracker STEM Pro uh, for university students to basically explore condensed matter nuclear science. And as we bring up that website, uh, that would be a good place for people to go and find out how to uh, learn more about this phenomenon. Excellent. Well, I'll add that link to the blog post that will accompany this episode just so everyone can find that nice and easily. But I can't thank you enough for coming on here today. Yes, it's a complex subject, but I really do think you've told it in a language that everybody can understand. And I think that tech, as that technology is refined and scaled and different materials and ways of driving reactions will be realized. And you've made a big part towards that today. So thanks for joining me today, Larry. Neil, it has been a pleasure. Thank you. Wow, there was a serious amount of knowledge there, wasn't there? The history of cold fusion research, progress of Larry's own research, applications of his research, the tracker STEM program, and also the methods to drive and monitor condensed matter nuclear reactions in industrial, US Navy, and, and NASA laboratories, all with an eye towards a clean, energy-rich future. And with so much bad news out there at the moment, it's nice to hear something positive, isn't it? But I suspect there are many of you listening out there with far more knowledge in this area than I have. So I invite you to share your opinions and thoughts and insights with me by simply emailing me techblogwriter at outlook.com. And you can get me on my website, techblogwriter.co.uk, where you can find 1,200 other episodes and learn how you can work with me if a daily tech podcast is not enough for you. But that's it for today. So I'll see you all bright and early tomorrow with another guest. So thanks for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.